Well, good evening. It is uh, great to be with you this evening. I want to welcome you here in the West Auditorium, as well as everybody joining us online. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bible or your Bible app to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to get there in just a moment. Uh, But before we do that, I'm just going to start right off with something really controversial. I'm just going to say it. And I know some of you are really not going to like this. So I'm just going to get it out there. Here it is. I love report cards. I love them. (laughs) And I know some of you are like, I don't even know what that is because I, I know today my kids, their grades are all online and they can be checked at any time. But when I was a kid, we actually had to go to school and report cards came in an envelope like this. This is my sixth grade report card, Mr. Galindo. And, and, I, and I looked forward to going to school to get this. And I know some of you are thinking like, Jonathan, you are a massive nerd. Like, do you not realize that report cards are an institutionalized, biased way of grading kids? I mean, C's get degrees, am I right? <laughs> and if that's you, then I just wanna say, keep telling yourself whatever you have to, but for those of us who, ex- who value excellence and hard work and doing what's right, yes, I am a firstborn. <laughs> report cards matter, okay? And why do report cards matter? Because they're a way of telling, at least for me, whether we measured up or not. I loved going to report card day because it was a day where I knew that I hadn't measured up except for that one C in weightlifting class my junior year of high school, not that I'm still angry 25 years later, but report cards were a way of telling that we measured up. And you know what, not all of us love report cards. Some of us tried to get them in our dog's mouth before mom and dad saw them. And again, some of our students today are like, hey, can we go back to that system? Because that sounds way better than mom and dad knowing constantly what my grades are. And while I realize we can't all agree on this, I think we can all agree on this one idea, and that is that we each have moments in our lives where we find, we want, find ourselves wondering how we are measuring up. We, ha- we each have moments in our lives where we find ourselves wondering how are we measuring up. And you know, maybe that's um, in, in a relationship with a friend, you know, wondering, do, do they know that I care? Do they know that I'm invested in this? Maybe it's with a boss, maybe it's with a teacher, maybe it's with a parent, or a spouse, or a sibling, or a child. Maybe it's with our finances, like, hey, are we measuring up with our finances? Um, But I would also suspect that for most of us that there are moments where we wonder, are we measuring up when it comes to our spirituality? Are we doing the things that we know that we need to do? Are, Are we doing enough? And I know that's a weird question. We're not supposed to ask questions like that because we know that God has freely given us his grace. He has freely shown us his mercy, right? but we still find ourselves at time wondering things. We, we find ourselves wondering questions like, am I doing this right? Am I doing the right things? Am I growing? Am I doing this because it seems right or is it because what God has called me to do? And I've certainly had these questions, yeah, these questions right here. Am I doing this right? Am I doing the right things? Am I growing? Am I doing this because it seems right or because God is at work in my life. And I certainly had these questions in my faith journey as well. I remember when I was seven years old, I invited Jesus into my life to be the leader and the Lord of my life. And then I did it again a week later. And then I did it ultimately about 19 times because I wasn't sure that it took. I wasn't sure that I did it the right way. And I know I'm not alone in this because um, a few years ago I was having lunch with a friend and we'd been talking for a while, a friend who actually attended here and at one point, he just goes, so what do you think? And I was like, what, what do I think about what? And he's like, well, am I doing it? Am I, am I following Jesus? And I was like, whoa, dude, I, where did that come from? Like, we've been talking about all these other things. Like, where did that come from? What, what are you asking me, really? And he said, you know, I've just, I've been following Jesus for a long time, and I just keep wondering, am I doing this right? And I suspect that for many of us, we wonder that too. Are, Are we doing this faith thing right? Are we doing what God has called us to do? You know, more often than not, we're not asking questions like, you know, does God love us unconditionally? Did he send Jesus on our behalf? Is he with us? But we do wonder, are we doing this faith thing the right way? Are we doing the right things? If God were to give us a report card right now, what would it say? And because God loves us and because he knows what we need, it shouldn't surprise us that God has a lot to say about the way that we live out our lives. In fact, one of the passages where Jesus speaks very clearly to this is in the Sermon on the Mount. 
And this is the sermon that we've been looking at for the last several weeks, uh, the sermon that we're calling the best sermon ever. And throughout this sermon, we have looked at what Jesus had to say about influence and anger and integrity and lust and divorce and sexuality. And in each of these topics, Jesus said, hey, you've heard it said. You, you know what, the, what God's word says about these things. But then he went on to say, but I say. And in every single one of these topics, Jesus got down to the heart of the matter. He said, it's not just what you do, it's how you think about these things. It's about what's going on inside you internally. How do you think, how do you feel, how do you react? And so everything we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount so far has been about our internal lives, about the way that we think, about the way that we feel, about the way that we react. But today, Jesus, he turns a corner, and he starts to talk about the things that we do, about how we live our lives out, about what God has called us to do and the way that we live our lives. In other words, how do we wave our white flag of surrender when it comes to the way that we live out our lives and particularly regarding our faith? Which brings me back to the question that I asked just a few minutes ago about living out our faith. When it comes to spiritual practices like prayer and fasting or trusting God, how are we supposed to do it and how do we know that we are getting it right? And really, it surprises me that this part of the Sermon on the Mount is there. I mean, Jesus has talked about some really heavy stuff, right, about anger and lust and integrity. And then all of a sudden, he starts talking about prayer and fasting. And some of you are like, oh, good, I haven't had a church nap in a long time. I can take one right now. It's not as intense as the last few weeks. But here's what strikes me. Like, if Jesus brings this up, as he's talking about all these other things, then they must be as important as all of those other things. And so with that in mind, what does Jesus say about prayer and fasting and what it means for us to live those out in our lives? And so we're gonna start with Matthew 6, verse five, and just the first four words, and this is what Jesus says. He says, and when you pray, and when you pray. And he's gonna go on to say a whole lot more. We're gonna get to that in a moment, but before we do, I wanna focus on just the first three words of Matthew 6, verse 16. When you fast. When you pray and when you fast. And we notice that here that Jesus didn't say if you pray or if you feel like it or if you get around to it. He didn't even say, hey, you should pray and fast. He says when. In other words, it's assumed. It's something that he did and he assumed his followers would also be doing. And for some of us, the word when is really enough. Like, you come tonight, you're like, okay, God, I wanna hear from you. And maybe that's enough because prayer and fasting are not a part of your spiritual rhythm. They're not a part of the way that you live your life. Or maybe you're newer to the life of church or just church in general, and you're like, wow, this is just sort of unfamiliar to me. What do I do with that? Well, before we get to that, I wanna just really quickly note, like, God is not up in heaven with a cosmic gold star chart keeping track of every time you pray and fast, like, oh, hey, look, Dave, he, he just 72 day streak, great job, Dave. No, that's not what happen, what's happening. But I do wanna say this, this is obviously something that is important to us because Jesus mentioned it as something when, something that we should be doing. And so what do we do with that? How do we pursue that? And if you're here today and you're not in the when category yet, uh, we would love to help you with that. Our pastors and our staff, our church leaders, they'd love to meet with you and help you figure out how to get those rhythms in your day-to-day life. Um, we also have some resources on the website for this sermon series, thebestsermonever.com. And if you go there, you can check out that webpage. You can look at some of the resources there. There's a couple of really great books on prayer. There is a app, like for your phone, that you can use to help you with this. There's a video study on the topic of fasting that you can check out. And so really step one is when. You know, when, when are you gonna do these things? When are these gonna be a part of your life? But Jesus goes on to say a whole lot more, so let's dive back into what Jesus has to say about prayer, and we're gonna look at Matthew 6, verse five, and this is what Jesus says. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Okay, what's going on here? Why is Jesus calling people hypocrites, and why why is he talking about rewards. I mean, we just said that there's no like cosmic gold star chart that Jus is keeping track of. But here's what we know. In Jesus' day, apparently, um, there were people 
oftentimes religious leaders who were making a point of praying in a way where other people would notice them, where they would admire them, where they would respect them. And what Jesus is saying here is that those people, they have their reward in full. In fact, they got your attention, they impressed you, and that's all they're gonna get. That's all prayer is going to be about for them. But Jesus says, you know, when it comes to this matter, he gets down to the heart of this one just like he does every other thing in this, this sermon series, this sermon that he's preached. And this is what Jesus gets down to. He says, is the spiritual practice of prayer about connection with God or about convincing others that you are holy? You see, Jesus, he looks at these people who are trying to impress other people and he goes, hey, look, that's great that they got your attention, but they are missing the point completely. And so, if that's not the point of prayer, obviously it's not, then what do we do? Like, what are the prayer rules, okay? So how do we even start prayer? You know, is it, is it dear God or is it, oh, most holy, omnipotent Father? Do we have to pray in King James language? When it comes time to end prayer, is it just amen? Or is it in Jesus' name, amen? Or is it in the name? Check one, two. All right, let me try that again. So when it comes to the end of prayer, is it just amen or in Jesus' name, amen, or in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, amen? And what about this? When it comes to falling asleep during prayer, is God offended? Does he put us in like prayer timeout for like seven weeks if we fall asleep when we pray? Well, here's the, here's the key thing. We do have to pray in King James language. That's something we want you to make sure you, I'm just kidding, you don't, you don't have to. In fact, uh, we should know that a relational God who loves us never expects us to pray to him in formal language. But it can be intimidating, right? Praying with people can be intimidating. Like, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have ever prayed with like a prayer ninja? Like people who when they pray, God is like, whoa, that was, <laughs> that was good, right? And he looks at your prayer and he's like, yeah. But he looks at them and he's like, yeah, we can, let's do more of that, right? How many of you have ever prayed to somebody like that? Somebody who prays by like chapter and verse and they know God's word, right? And I wanna be really clear, I'm not making fun of those people. Uh, there are a lot of people here in the life of the church that have rich and deep and meaningful prayer lives like that and I admire and respect them and I hope someday to have a prayer life like that. But I also realize that we can't start there, right? We can't start praying that way. But see, Jesus says, this is how you then pray. If, if that's not how you pray, then how do you start? In Matthew 6, this one's not working, awesome. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse six, Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus says, hey, you wanna get this prayer thing right? Here's what you do. You go into a private space, and you talk to me, and you share your heart and your mind with your Father, and you let him know what has your attention, and that's what prayer looks like. But then Jesus says something really weird. He says, then your Father who sees what's done, he will reward you. And I said already, like, Jesus, God's not keeping track of our prayers, right, how often we do them. So what is that about? Well, the word that Jesus uses for room there is actually a reference to a storeroom where treasure is kept. And what Jesus is saying is just the act of going into that room and connecting with your heavenly Father and getting to know him, that is the true treasure. But Jesus goes on, he says this in verses seven and eight. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus is saying, hey, when you pray, it's not about how many words you use or how fancy your words are. Another way of saying that is that, that the length of our prayer does not matter nearly as much as the weight of our prayers. The length of our prayers does not matter nearly as much as the weight of our prayers. And so with that in mind, um, how do we pray then? What does that look like? And so as we read the, the words that come after these words, Jesus, he gives this very powerful example of what this kind of prayer looks like, a heartfelt 
genuine prayer. It's a prayer that's very well known. It's a prayer called the Lord's Prayer that we pray around here on a fairly regular basis. And uh, Pastor Brian in January, he taught this fantastic sermon about the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm not gonna cover that tonight, but I would encourage you to go check that out. Look at that kind of example of what it means to pray to God that way. But I, I do wanna ask one question. When it comes to this idea of getting alone with God, of, of being with him, here's the question I think we all need to answer, and that is this, where is my space? Not my space like the early 2000s social network, but <laughs> where is my space? Where I go and I connect with God, where I am with him, where I experience his heart. And maybe for you this week, maybe that's exactly what it comes down to is, is finding that space, whether that's a space in your home where you can go and you can be quiet and you can be with God. If you're like, man, my home is never quiet, then I would ask like, hey, is there a time or a time of day where you can go sit in your car and you can be intentional about connecting with your father? Or maybe for you, it's uh, just being outside. It's getting warmer outside. Is there a space that you can go be outside? And so Jesus, he, he brings clarity to what it means to live this prayer thing out. It's not about us, it's not about how we appear, it's not about fancy words, it's about genuinely connecting with our Heavenly Father. But then Jesus, he goes on to talk about fasting. And it's really interesting because if you read these words, it really follows the same pattern as, as he already has followed in the, in the prayer pattern. So this is what, what Jesus has to say about fasting. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. You see, Jesus practiced fasting. He knew it was something that he, he did and others should do as well. And so I wanna just quickly define what is fasting because in its most simple essence, fasting really is, fasting is when you refrain from food for a longer than normal period for the purpose of freeing up more time for prayer and other spiritual disciplines. So fasting is separating ourselves from a, a meal or something we would normally eat for the purpose of, of praying and other spiritual disciplines. You see, Jesus' instructions here, here, they are the same though. Jesus is talking about fasting the same way he talks about prayer. He says, if, if fasting is about you, then you've missed the mark. If you're gonna fast, Shampoo your hair, brush your teeth, put your deodorant on, doing all the things you would normally do so that it doesn't appear to others that something different is happening. But Jesus also uses the same language of this idea of reward. He says, and your father who sees what you've done in secret will reward you. But how does that work? I mean, that's just kind of strange, right? And so I was thinking about this. I was talking with uh, Pastor Thomas over lunch a few weeks ago, and, and he shared with me that he'd been fasting. He didn't tell me to brag. Obviously, that would have been a problem. And in fact, I asked him later, I said, he's like, did I like, make a big deal out of that? I was like, no, I asked you, you just answered my questions. But uh, before we met, I had had this awesome spicy chicken sandwich. And I just wanted to tell somebody how great it was. And so I sat down with Pastor Thomas, and I was like, hey man, how was lunch today? He's like, well, actually, I, I didn't eat. And I was like, oh, everything okay? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just fasting. So of course I felt super spiritual at that point because I wanted to talk about a sandwich and he had been fasting, right? <laughs> um, and I said, uh, okay, so how's that going? He said, well, it's going good. He, he said, you know, I'm kind of hungry today, but I just, I really wanna hear from God. So again, I felt super spiritual at that point. And he told me how he had been praying about some things in his personal life, but also praying about some things here in the life of the church. And so what he said next uh, really caught my attention. He said, a few days prior, he had been uh, intending to fast, to pray about those same things. And he gave in and he ended up eating lunch that day and almost immediately he began to worry about the things that he had intended to pray about. In other words, he, he missed out on that reward that Jesus is talking about, the, the hope and the peace and the clarity that comes when we live things out the way that, that God calls us to. And so, just as we ask the question, where is my space when it comes to prayer, I think a really good question for fasting is, what can I give up? You know, and maybe for you, this has not been a regular part of a rhythm of life for you. And so maybe this week, it comes down to, hey, I'm just gonna choose one meal 
and I'm not gonna eat that meal, and, and during that meal, I'm gonna take time to pray, to, to connect with God, to be with him, to experience that reward of being with him. And maybe for you, it's not really about food at all. In fact, while fasting is formally or typically around food, um, sometimes it can just be about stepping away from something that's normally a part of our life to create space to connect with God. I know for me, one of the most meaningful fasting experiences I've had was just a week where I stepped away from everything that was a screen, whether it was a computer or my phone or um, video games or whatever, just to spend time with God. And so maybe for you this week, it's not skipping a meal. Maybe it's a day where you step away from your phone or you step away from social media to create space to be with God. And uh, speaking of, of creating space or giving something up, uh, typically in the 40 days that lead up to Easter, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, uh, many, many Christians decide to do this. They decide to fast, to give something up, to create space to hear from God. And uh, in essence, they're basically saying like, God, I, I, I wanna give this up because I want you more than I want this thing. And there really are a couple different ways uh, to do this. As we, as we think about this, this idea of surrender, of coming before God, of, of giving something up to connect with him, there are a couple ways to do it wrong. Uh, first of all, giving up something that you never do is probably not super helpful. For instance, I, I can give up skydiving or eating Brussels sprouts, but that's not really gonna be much of a sacrifice. I know some of you love Brussels sprouts, it's not personal. Um, another thing you can do wrong is give up something that's easily replaceable with something else. And I know for me one year um, during this season, I, I decided I was gonna give up chocolate to create space to be with God. And I know that sounds kind of spiritual to some of you who really love chocolate, but what I realized is that Reese's Pieces have no chocolate in them. <laughs> and so rather than using that time to connect with God, I ate enough Reese's Pieces to get E.T. from New York to L.A. and back, okay? <laughs> and so all joking aside, um, you know, there, this is a great season for us to devote ourselves to focusing on Christ, to being with him, to, to connecting with him. And we wanna help you do that as your church, to take these 40 days, we just crossed that 40 day mark, we're really more like 36 days. But to take these 36 days to surrender our lives, to surrender ourselves to Jesus. And so one of the ways that we wanna help you do that is, is each week we're gonna create midweek videos from different staff members to, to help you think, to help you focus. And we'd love for you to take time to watch those, to reflect, and to, to grow along with all of us in that process. And so those are gonna be available through our emails each week. If you already get those, that's great. If you don't, your host is gonna tell you at the end of the service how you can be a part of that. Okay, so we've looked at what Jesus has to say about prayer and about fasting. We've looked at these questions. Uh, where is my space? What can I give up? Uh, but before we wrap up today, I wanna, I wanna just acknowledge that when it comes to prayer and fasting, it isn't always sunshine and roses. In fact, at times it can really feel discouraging. It can feel confusing. And I love that Jesus knew that. Because Jesus doesn't just talk about prayer once in the Sermon on the Mount. He actually talks about it two times. And the second time, this is what Jesus has to say. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. He's inviting us to ask him for things. He wants us to ask him for things. He says, ask, ask him for what we need. He says, seek, keep asking and keep looking for God to move. And then knock, because sometimes when we ask God for things, it really feels like the door of heaven is shut to us. But Jesus says, when we ask and when we knock, that the door is open to us, that God will open that door to us. And I, and I love this too, because these words, ask, seek, and knock, they're in the present tense, which may not seem like a big deal to us, but in the original Greek, words that are in the present tense, they're meant to be done repeatedly, and they're meant to be done in an ongoing way. So Jesus is basically saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on asking me. But I, I just wanna be honest for a minute and just say there have been times in my life where I have asked, seeked, and knocked and just still been like, God, I, I don't know if you're there. I don't know if you're listening. I don't know if I could trust you with these big things in my life. And I love again that Jesus understood that. I love what he says next in Matthew 7, verses nine through 11. It says, which of you, 
If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good give, give, good, give good gifts to those who ask him? I love the, the way the message paraphrase puts this as well. It says, if your child asks you for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think that God who conceived you in love will be even better? Jesus is saying, hey, even mediocre parents, even flawed parents, they give their kids good gifts. How much more so is that true of the gifts that I give? So as I think about Jesus standing on a hillside, teaching this Sermon on the Mount, what I really hear him saying to the people around him, to us today, is will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you continue to ask and seek and knock? Even when it's difficult, even when it feels disappointing, will you continue to believe that our Father is a good Father who gives good gifts? And uh, I mentioned that there have been seasons where I feel like I've asked and seeked and knocked and found myself wondering, like, God, are you there? And one of those seasons for me was the season of deciding whether to come here to First Christian or to stay at the church that we were part of in Michigan. And don't get me wrong, I, I love First Christian. I love this place. Um, but we had, Andrew and I had great jobs in Michigan. Our kids loved their schools. And we'd been a part of that church for 17 years. And I remember daily, multiple times a day, asking, seeking, and knocking, God, please just tell me what to do. I wanna do what you wanna do. I wanna, I wanna go where you want me to go. But please just tell me. And day after day, I felt like I got nothing. And then the morning came where I had to make the decision. And I, I went to a coffee shop and, and I felt the weight of that decision and I felt like, God, I've done everything I know to do. I don't know what to do. <clears throat> and I just remember this moment where God said, do you trust me? Do you believe that I have your best interest in mind? Do you believe that I have good things for you? And so here we are, eight years later, happy to be here. And I realize that story has a happy ending to it. I realize it's a good story, but I also am aware that sometimes when we ask and seek and knock, it doesn't end that way. Sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's difficult. And yet, even in those moments, I, I hear God saying, I hear Jesus saying through this passage, will you trust me? <clears throat> will you continue to ask and seek and knock, believing that I'm a good father who gives good gifts? And so when it comes to, to living out our spirituality, to making the grade, as it were, you know, how do we do that? Well, I feel like Jesus, he says, you know what, it's, it's actually pretty easy. It comes down to two things. I, I want you to be with me, and I want you to trust me. I want you to be with me, and I want you to trust me. And so really, these, these three questions that we've talked about tonight, uh, where's my space? Where can I go to be alone with God, to connect with him, to, to just be with him? What time of day can I do that if it's not a space? Or what can I give up? What, what am I willing to say, God, you are more important to me than this thing, and I wanna set this aside for a season. I wanna set this aside to connect with you. Or will you trust me? Do you find yourself in a season where God is dealing with some things or you've got some heavy stuff going on? Will you trust me? And maybe if you're doing really well in all three of these things, I wanna ask you to think about something else and that's, you know, who else can you bring along with you? Who, who can you mentor? Who can you guide? Um, <clears throat> but just like many sermons, I don't know about you, but there are times I listen to sermons and I'm like, I need to absolutely do something about that. And then we head out to the car and the kids are fighting and we're hungry and we're thinking about the 17 other things that we have to do this evening. And all that good intention just goes away. And so how I wanna close our time today is I wanna give you time to reflect and to make a commitment. I wanna give you time and space to think about these three questions and maybe that fourth one as well. And I'm gonna ask you uh, to whatever that is, whatever God's drawn your attention to, whether it has to do with prayer or fasting or trusting him, to write that down somewhere where you can't ignore it. Put it in your calendar, put it in a reminder in your phone, set an alarm for later, write it on a piece of paper in a place you know you're gonna see it later later 
And so as the musicians play, I just wanna take about 45 seconds to give you space to do that. So that when you leave here, that you actually step into that. And so as the music plays, go ahead and write that down and I'll come back up in just a few seconds and pray for us. You know, as I was thinking about the commitments that we made tonight, as I was thinking about um, just the idea of each of us stepping into prayer and fasting in a greater way, um, I, I just I realized, you know, that is something that we do individually. Um, but how cool that we get to do that corporately as well as a congregation. I mean, can you imagine if we really take this seriously, if we really do pray, we really do fast together, what God might do in our city, in our community, to deal with some of the things that, that we know, the struggles that we have as a city or a community. And, and really, what about, as a church, what about the influence that we might have in the world around us? How might that look different? Or what if there's like a new ministry that God's been waiting to call us to, but we haven't seen it yet because we haven't intentionally spent time in prayer and fasting as a congregation. And so as I close this in prayer, I wanna pray for each of us for the commitments that we made, but I also wanna pray for us as a congregation that God will continue to use us in a mighty way here in, in, the, in our community as well as just throughout the world and everything that he has called us to. And so let's pray about those things together. God, I just wanna thank you. Lord, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you're with us, Lord. God, thank you for um, just the gift that, that prayer and fasting are, Lord. God, we realize that at times they, they can be difficult, at times they can be confusing, and yet, God, you know that there are things that we need. You know that there are things that, that you use to draw us to you. So, God, I pray for each person here in the room tonight. Lord, I pray for each person online, Lord, um, that whatever they wrote down, whatever you've drawn their attention to, God, that they, you would give them the courage to step forward and do that. And God, as they seek you, as they ask, seek, and knock, God, that, that they would find you in the midst of that. And Lord, I also just, I thank you, God, for the, the way that you've brought us together as a church, Lord. Thank you for the, the many ministries that you've led us to and that you faithfully provide for, God. Uh, but Lord, we, we don't know what's next. And we know that you do. And so God, I pray that as we seek you, Lord, through prayer and fasting, God, you would open our eyes to, to ways that you can use us as a church to continue to impact others, God, that the people would experience your love and your care and your attention and your truth through us, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen.